The following program may contain coarse language. Viewer discretion is advised. This is a special live CBC Music presentation. I don't know, we're gonna have a good time. You guys excited? I'm excited. Turn your ringers off, hashtag QJunos. Let's go with the show, you ready to go? All right, I'm gonna be quiet and then I'm gonna be loud. I'm gonna tell you when to get loud starting now. Hoover, this is Q. I'm Tom Bauer, we have a huge show for you today. Amazing June Alma nominees. Lights and Ruth B are here. For the first time in over 30 years, comedy is back at the Junos. One of Vancouver's own is nominated. Ivan Decker is here. One is an iconic singer-songwriter. One is an iconic producer. Jan Arden and Bob Rock are here. The great Vancouver playwright Jill Dom is here. Plus, we have a live edition of our block party with our friend Chaos. Our cue this team and CBC's Vancouver's Stephen Quinn are gonna tell you what the most Vancouver song is of all time. All that coming up on a special edition of Q, live at the Junos. All right, all right, all right. Well, we want to kick the night off with a bang, and what better way to do it than with someone who calls the Lower Mainland of BC home. Someone who, the last time the Junos were in Vancouver, won for Best New Artist. A musician who since then has gone on to tour the world, win the Juno for Pop Album of the Year, released four records, and even put out her own comic book. And she decided, after a few years in Toronto, I'm moving back to BC. This weekend, she's up for Pop Album of the Year and Artist of the Year. Ladies and gentlemen, performing her new single, We Were Here, please give it up for Lights.
Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. It's not, good to be back. Not far to go, right? Not far to no, go. No, I drove in from Mission this morning. Drove in from Mission BC today. <laughs> nice drive. And I mean this in the, most, in the most respectful way. Why did you move back to BC? <laughs> my family's lived here for a long time. And yeah. uh, when I found out I was going to be a mom, I was like, I'm not raising my kid on like Avenue Road in Toronto. I'm going to move to Mission. There's lots of space. There's lots of trees. we got like kind of a bear issue, but that's OK. Yeah. We work through it. Uh we work through it. We all Lots do. Lots of life lessons in that. We work through all of our bear issues you in one way or another. You know what I mean? Everybody's got a bear issue. Yeah, exactly. Uh, what, what's, the, um, what's the benefit, though, as a musician? Like, do you find any, do you find any great benefit here? Well, in reality, you're not really ever home. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I'm, like, on tour most of the time. And when I'm home, I kind of just don't want to be in a major city. So just being kind of in the bush with bear issues is really nice. But you know, that, is, that, is that hard at all? Like, I think most, like, most people here and myself, like, we spend a lot of time in our, in our homes down on the road. Like, do you find it? You've been doing it since like, you were how long on the road? I've been, I mean, I've been touring for 10 years now. So my first tour was like fall of 2008, and it's kind of been this big realization because I'm in the middle of a tour right now. And uh, it's kind of crazy. I've been doing it for 10 years. But yeah, I think there's, there's creativity and inspiration and solace, you know, when you're out there and... Uh, we have a studio in the garage, and I spend a lot of time just kind of not being surrounded by chaos. Because when I go visit Toronto now, it's like, I'm going to go out, I'm going to have fun, be with my friends, and being here is just very, very chill. I'm going to be surrounded by chaos in about five minutes. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> that was you great. remember the deal? Remember the deal? There we go. <laughs> that was amazing. That was uh, Yeah, I know, amazing. I know. But, but when I was working on the comic... I was holed up there for about a year. Honestly, I was at home for a year, and I started getting cabin fever. Do you guys know about? Do you guys know about? Do you guys know there about, about Lights is. is comic? A skin and earth. Yeah, I drew and wrote that six-issue series, and it took uh, a little bit of cabin fever. Get, how get does to the end of it? How does putting out a comic book um, relate or differ with putting out a record, putting out music? It's like, I mean, it's my first time doing a comic, so it was a lot of like YouTube University, you know, like actually just looking things up online every time I had to figure something out. <laughs> and I'm kind of thankful that I learned it all. Now I know I have a whole new skill set. But it's, it's, um, it's not too different in the layering process. I mean, you start out with an idea, you sketch it in, you start to fill in all the blanks, and then you have an end product at the end. But uh, it's just, it is a whole different skill set. It really is. And being able to merge both worlds was really special. I like how the difference between you and me is that like, I use YouTube to figure out how to unclog my sink. Oh, you can do that too. You and can you're be like, a doctor. And yeah, oh yeah, you can be a doctor. Yeah, yeah I'm going to the, anything you want. I'm going YouTube. to that surgeon. Yeah, I know. You know, YouTube. So you know, the appendix is bothering me. Yeah, it's probably somewhere around your shoulder, man. That's all I don't know. Yeah, it's probably it's probably true. It's probably true. <laughs> sure. Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, how are you feeling about the Junos this weekend? Very excited. It's 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 kind of it feels like this like like you were mentioning that 2009 was my first Junos ever. And I took home Best New Artist, and uh, I had just left. Yeah, it was crazy surprise. Thank you. Uh, it was awesome. Good feeling. Um, and it's like everything has kind of come full circle, and I've been uh, on a journey, quite literally, for the last number of years since, I, since that first year. And I feel like I've full, like, just gone through such an experience, you know, like learning about myself. And this record feels like the most myself. And now I'm coming back, not a new artist, but... An artist that feels whole, you know, and does, does for the that, first time. Does that best new artist co come with like a certain expectation? Like we're having Ruth B on later. We're gonna talk about this. Like, does that is it is it like oh I won this and now I better I better get going? I I mean I think it's kind of like I the way I received it. I don't know how you're supposed to receive it, but the way I received it was like 
um, I must be doing something right, you know? And because like, in music, there's no rules. Like there's no rules in this industry and there's no, nobody telling you what's right or what's wrong. So you just kind of wing it. No one really knows what they're doing, except for you. Oh yeah, I you know exactly of, what I'm doing. Yeah, you know, yeah. Look at you, I'm like, that guy knows Yeah, this jean jacket yeah. here until you know what I'm yeah, doing. You know? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> And, I'm going to uh, go for Al Borland. That might be what I'm oh going for. Yeah. That's the second time Al's come up today. That's amazing. Well, I'm, I've been around all day. <laughs> does it mean oh more God. for you to be nominated at home? Like, does this mean a bit more to see now that you're in BC? Especially because my family can come, you know? Like, Are they here? Are they here? My husband's coming. Everyone lives here. We all, yeah, we all have a little compound out in Mission, you know? It's like, so it makes it sound extra weird, but it's it not. Does it does sound a little weird. weird. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> it's not a Sandbags cult. all around. Yeah. It's a moat. <laughs> That would be a great idea. That might solve the bear issue. I'm not sure. You know, you know what? We can always look it up on YouTube. <laughs> How about another round of applause for our friend Lates? Are you going to come back and sing another song yeah, later in the show? Back. She's going to come back and sing another song later in the show. Ladies and gentlemen, good luck this weekend. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Lights. I am going to end my favorite thing about Vancouver is returning to it from somewhere else. I think it's easy when you're here for a long time to kind of forget how stunning the mountains are or how clean the air smells. I love coming back home. The doors of YVR open up and you, and you just kind of take a big breath of Pacific air. You're listening to Q live at the Junos from Vancouver. Go and pack me up by my soul. Go and pack me up by my soul. Go and pack me up by my soul. Dan is here. Dan, are you here? Yeah. yeah, there he is. Hi, Dan. Hi, how you doing? <laughs> That's the familiar guttural yell of Dan Mangan. We're so happy to be here in Vancouver for the Junos, this beautiful city. As soon as you fly in, you realize just how stunning it really is. The North Shore Mountains, the Pacific Ocean, the Douglas Firs. You walk around Vancouver, you see the neon lights, cobblestone streets, Ross Rebliotti, and you can easily see He's not a, I, I saw him. <laughs> you can easily see how so many musicians would move here to be inspired by that. If you're a regular Q listener, you might be familiar with something we call the Q Block Party. It's when we have an artist pick a city that means something to them. We ask them to pick songs that take them back to that city. See, normally our producers take like weeks and months and stress over them and make them perfect. But today in Vancouver, we're going to do one live. You are way too effusive too early. <laughs> Please welcome a musician who fell so in love with Vancouver when he first toured here that he moved here. He recorded most of his albums here, most of them Juno Award winning, I should say. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, Chaos. <laughs> Hey man. Hey. How are you? How you doing? I'm doing all right. So I should say, like, you're from you're from Toronto. But I am. Anyone who doubts your credibility as a Vancouverite, even before you officially moved here, you were spending a lot of time here, right? I was. Yeah. Well, what, what did you love about out here? Um, <clears throat> unbeknownst to a lot of the world, Vancouver has some of the most amazing studios in the world. Um, <clears throat> Brian Adams has a studio here called the Warehouse. Yeah, beautiful. There's the Armory. I mean, Guns N' Roses have recorded here, Aerosmith, Bob Rock is here. Uh, it's, just, it's just an amazing city to record in. And you know Bob Rock's here, too? Yeah, I saw him. I saw his beautiful blonde hair flowing through the backstage somewhere. <laughs> Bob Rock doesn't walk, he saunters. He saunters. Saunters beautifully. So we're going to do a cute block party today. You're, Let's we're, go. We're going to play clips from a playlist you gave us, and you're going to tell us how each song relates to a certain place and time in Vancouver. Are you ready? I'm ready. All right, here's song number one. Load Me Up by the Matthew Good Band. So Chaos, 
tell us about this song. What do you remember when you first heard it? Um, Matt Good basically comes down to me like riding my BMX bike with my walk, Sony Walkman, listening to that song, being like, why does, for some reason, this song fit in my neighborhood? And like, who is this dude, Matt Good? So I did some research, and he ended up being from Vancouver. And that was the first time I was like, what's this Vancouver place? He's from Burnaby, actually. And, and as a teenager, Michael J. Fox was a huge dude for me, and he was also from Burnaby. Yeah, shout out Burnaby. So I was like, what is this Burnaby place, and who are they? <laughs> what is this <laughs> mystical Burnaby? <laughs> what's, this mystic, what's this mystical Burnaby place? So I did my research, and then it was like, he just made, it's like me and my producers have a saying, it's like, we get a guitar sound in Vancouver, and it's like, can't get that guitar sound in Toronto. And like, Matt Good, that song kind of embodies that song. It's just a, I'm a very suburban guy. Like a lot of my cousins from Detroit and like Brooklyn and Scarborough and Toronto would be like looking at artists from there. And I was always like, I always had an idea of I wanted to figure out what was going on across Canada. I just always wanted to know what was happening in the suburbs. Because the internet has sort of made the, word, the world flat. The tiny and small, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so for, back then, if, if you heard a song and somebody related to you were so amazed that someone from so far away, like Vancouver, related to you. And I don't know, Matt Good, I don't know, weirdly enough, I related to Matt Good. I don't know yeah. why he was the dude. Let's go to a song number two. Take a listen. Song number two. In New York, they want oh, me. man, what a jam. And I'm gonna be there. That is Rascals featuring Chaos and Top of the World. Where does that song take you? Where does that go? Um, I met the Rascals at Much Music in Toronto in 1993. And they, t they took me on tour. And uh, the last stop on the tour was in Vancouver. And I'd never been to Vancouver before. This is like 1994, 95. And I came over the Canby Bridge and read one who's like a legend yeah. and a host of Vancouver, read one for the Rascals, make some noise. Um, we were coming over the bridge, I was like, man, I'm gonna move here someday. He was like, okay, buddy. He was like, cause he's used to everybody saying that when they come to Vancouver. Yeah, yeah, I know, yeah. But here I am, so thank you Vancouver so much. I meant it, I meant it. And uh, just the Rascals was like, if you were around and you were like a, a teenager in your early 20s when the Rascals came out, they were kind of like Wu-Tang and Souls of Mischief in one band because they were like these mischievous guys from Vancouver. Yeah. No one from Toronto had heard of anything that was hip hop outside of Toronto. And here come these two dreaded guys and their crew was huge. They had two B-boys and like, they'd always show up with 20 people. It was amazing. They just kind of took the music industry by storm and for some reason they wanted to include my nerdy self into the whole thing. <laughs> and, it, and this song is a perfect example of Red One just being so gracious and being like, you're gonna do a verse on this song and it ended up being like a cool thing. So I, I think we have a certain trend going. We have Matt Good from Burnaby. We have the Rascals from Vancouver. And then there's this. Here comes the sun. Little known group from Squamish. <laughs> That's the Beatles in Here Comes the Sun. So Mike, I wouldn't, why is this a Vancouver um, song for This you? goes back to like the whole Brian Adams thing, so. The reason why I wanted to work at the warehouse when my label EMI, when I was a kid, they're like, where do you want to record? I was like, Vancouver. They're like, why? The warehouse. Because Brian Adams had actually purchased the Neve board, the Beatles Neve board. So like my whole first two records, Joy for Rebellion and uh, Atlantis, was made on the same 
mixing board that the Beatles used. Amazing, amazing, incredible. And uh, I don't know, I, I chose Here Comes the Sun because Here Comes the Sun should be the like national anthem of Vancouver. Because when, <laughs> because, because when the sun comes out, when the sun comes out, people here are like shorts. Patio. Here comes the sun. They're like, yo, let's three degrees. Like We're gonna sandals, do it. twelve degrees. Here comes the sun. Let's <laughs> let's get it. Let's go. I think George Harrison should like it should be the national anthem. Yeah. And every single time there's a sunny day in Vancouver, which is every 24 days. We should play it over some speakers. They should just play it on every radio station <laughs> in Vancouver. You know what? We're and in. Everybody we'll, we'll will be like, here comes, here comes the sun. <laughs> Here comes the sun. All right, one more song, one more song. Are you ready? Yeah. Ready. Notes. These are the true notes I have. It says, that's Bombs Over Baghdad by Outkast. Ask Chaos about David Suzuki? I don't know about that one. Any idea? I don't know. I mean... Did David Suzuki write these notes no, that no. was going on? <laughs> Get me in there, man. No, um, Something about a party? Anything like that? Uh, bombs Over Baghdad, I mean, Outkast. I'm gonna go a little bit here. I, I know Andre personally from Outkast. I've seen him go from like the guy in Atlanta talking about Cadillacs to wearing a onesie, you know, in his career. And uh, <laughs> I think why I picked that song is that one day I was listening to the song in Vancouver and the chorus is like, don't pull your thing out unless you came to bang. And I was like, that is Jimi Hendrix. That chorus is Jimi Hendrix. Like the whole thing is Jimi. Then I watched the video again. I'm like, he's actually looks like Jimi Hendrix in the video. And Jimi Hendrix actually lived in Vancouver for a lot of people who don't know. Yeah. And uh, I will just leave the sentiment that Vancouver is a place where you can come and get weird. Like, when I'm in Toronto and I'm in the studio and I'm like in the factory of studios and you're making a beat and your beat's like and then next door the same beat's like you feel this pressure to do what everyone's doing. But then you come to Vancouver and you can just get weird. Yeah. And people don't care. And I feel like the weirdest music I made in my life was I made it in Vancouver. And thank you, Vancouver, for that. Uh, and it's, it's, I love, and I, let me just say this. There's a lot of bands that could have been up here tonight. Cobra Ramon, uh, you know, Louise Burns. Like, there's so many yep. bands from Vancouver. I love Jody. Jody Glenham, like, you know, Hey Ocean, could have talked about Vancouver, but my perspective is a Toronto guy's on Vancouver. Toronto guy's version on Vancouver. And in Toronto, everyone's like, get your money, make some money, make some money. Drake, The weekend. I got, I, my shoe's five foot. Well, my shoe's 12, 13 feet. It's yeah. like, everyone's just doing their thing. And then you come to Vancouver and you're just like this. <sighs> so Vancouver's like a little bit of Nirvana because actually, in in Hindu, Nirvana means to blow out. So when you're in Vancouver, I'm just like. <sighs> Can we all do it together? Ready? One, two, three. <sighs> Ladies and gentlemen, chaos, Thank everybody. You. Give them a round of applause. <laughs> I think I worked it out, by the way. All right, ready for this? I worked it out while I was talking to Kevin, when I was talking to chaos. In the early days, Talking about climate change wasn't that easy to do, and not a lot of people were doing it. David Suzuki was doing it. You might call him an outcast. <laughs> I just got a note that I lost the show, so... Uh... <laughs> Guys, thanks a lot for sticking around. We're gonna have more show to come. Are you excited? <laughs> There's more to come in Vancouver. Jill Dom is gonna be here. Inspired by her own life with her husband, John Mann, from Spirit of the West. She's gonna be up here debuting some new music for you. Ruth B is gonna be here. Plus, the great Jan Arden and Bob Rock.
Stephen Quinn and the Q this team are still ahead too. They're gonna help you figure out what is the most Vancouver song of all time. Don't forget cbcmusic.ca slash Junos is where you can go for everything CBC is doing around the awards this week. Make them wish they were here, Vancouver. I'm John Bauer. This is Q live from the Junos in Vancouver. We will be right back. God damn my belt. Um, the thing that I'm, the thing that I, I, I didn't tell you off the top is that I'm secretly like super nervous about this too. Like I know Stephen came out and was like, Tom loves doing these. He gets all excited. That was the worst Stephen Quinn impression in the world. He sounds like a guy who reported on the Hindenburg, you know, like he's gonna say extra, extra. Um, but I'm, I'm a little, I'm a little nervous doing these, especially doing the show because the show is in kind of like a quiet little room in Toronto and. Uh, to have you guys be such a great audience means the world to me. We're gonna be back again in about 45 seconds. You guys having a good time so far? All right, cool, 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 cool. It's going great, thanks. My mom did come here, that's great. All right, we're about 30 seconds away. Um, I don't know, I think, oh, thank you so much for the good luck. <laughs> That's so sweet. Good luck, buddy. That's not how you said it. You said it so sweetly and I turned it into something awful. Kind of what I do. Um, we're about 14 seconds away. You ready to clap, Vancouver? You ready to have a good time? All right, say hello to Frank, everybody. on CBC Radio 1, Sirius XM 169, and from PRI, or Public Radio International, I'm Tom Bauer, live at the Vogue Theatre in Vancouver. Our next guest is someone who's no stranger to the stage here in Vancouver. You might know her from her work on the long-running shows like Mom's the Word. She is one of this province's most beloved playwrights. Her new play, Forget About Tomorrow, is inspired by something personal, but very public as well. It's inspired by her relationship with her husband, John Mann, from the band Spirit of the West, and his diagnosis with early-onset Alzheimer's in 2014. And it became a kind of therapy for her to write about the experience through fiction but I'll let her tell you about that. Please welcome to the stage, Jill Dom. We arrived in December, we arrived in the storm. We stayed in the bars, on Jerry Cross Road. And there was nothing but brass tops and gold. Kept the shine on the bar with a squeeze of our drums. You have to excuse me, I'm not in my bed. Hi. How are you doing? It's nice to see you. Coochie. I'm from Burnaby. You're from Burnaby? Oh <laughs> I'm usually pretty shy to say that, but now I'm going to say it with super pride. Yeah, we're, we're, we're giving a lot of Burnaby credit here. Tonight, yeah. You know? um, tell me about workshopping this play. What, what, what was, when you started writing this in workshops, what was that like? Oh, it was uh, quite a wonderful experience because I started to, I was in a writing workshop called The Wedding Collective. And I was writing scenes about a woman whose husband had an early onset Alzheimer's diagnosis, but nobody knew that that was really my life. Right. And so it was a very cool, cathartic thing to be able to do. So, so what, why is it important when you go through something like this, which like, I think it's easy for us sitting in an audience, just me sitting here to see only the artfulness of it, but there's actually, you know, there was real things going on at home. Why was it important to have a creative outlet like that? Um, I think trying to express what was happening to me and the other people who John and I met who were in a similar situation, um, it gave us a sense of purpose. And I think in suffering, if you find a sense of purpose or meaning in it, it can really help you get through it. The play is really about Jane as she handles her husband Tom's life-changing Alzheimer's diagnosis, the toll it takes, again, while having normal family responsibilities. She's exhausted. She begins to question if it's even what she wants. So even though you wrote it, I have to imagine you learn something about yourself while writing it. Um, yeah. <laughs> because I wrote it, uh, it, it took five years really to complete. So it was over like a whole spectrum for myself. Um, 
I learned that I could survive it. Yeah. So in a way, writing a survival story helped me survive it. Yeah. And I also learned that the acceptance of a really brutal diagnosis like that of someone you love is one of the hardest things. Yeah. Because you can't live in it if you're running away from it and pretending it's not happening. Yeah. But then, but then you have to watch someone actually kind of act it out. Is that is that hard or is it? No, that's really beautiful. First of all, she's a gorgeous actor, <laughs> very <laughs> funny and charming. Well, I'm not surprised. <laughs> so that's really. Uh... <laughs> oh my god. But no, really. I mean, it must be. It must be. Therapy, no, then. it's really. Um, it's just so great to uh, sit in the audience and watch the play and have it resonate with all kinds of people. Yeah. Uh, did, 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 did you have any conversations with John about this? Yeah. Um, well, the woman has a, I don't know, a flirtation that happens with this other man, the wife. And uh, John used to love to read the scenes that I uh, had written with the other man. He thought that was super cool. He was like, really? oh, yeah, this is like getting inside your fantasy life. <laughs> 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 so he liked that. Um, he wrote two songs for the play. Um, he, and he uh, forget to forget the last song he ever wrote, so it's pretty cool that um, that, that has a life. I mean, I, th this is I wasn't I wasn't planning on asking this, but like, how is it with just people like me asking you questions about this? Because again, like, it's an incredibly hard thing to go through, and not only do you have to go through, but you have to kind of talk about it. How are you finding it? I like talking about it because it's my life, so it. Yeah, I, I, like I said, I, it's really important to me to live it and not pretend it's not actually happening. And it means so much to other people too. I'm sure people who are experiencing similar things to you are coming up to you as well, right? Yeah. <laughs> Listen to that. That's real. You, 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 must have, you must have people talking to you about it. Oh, I do. I actually love to go to the theater and watch it. <laughs> so I've watched it quite a few times and talk to people as they're leaving. And uh, well, I've had some pretty cool, meaningful conversations. There's a real sense of camaraderie. I mean, there's strength and unity. Yeah, it reminds you that you're not alone. Eh? Yeah, of it's course. It's the most beautiful thing in the world. Yeah. Um, but I should say also, you're like watching these things. You usually act in the things you write. Is that, is that strange too? Um, it was a huge relief to not uh, have to act in it. Well, first of all, no one would believe it's not really my life story if I was up there. Yeah. But the part takes a lot of acting chops uh, that I don't really have. She's a really amazing actor. Um, I, I want to close off like this. So John is such a beloved man in Canadian music. Um, <laughs> Not just, not just here in Vancouver, but even, but yeah, I remember even back in Newfoundland, just hearing, I don't know, I'm from, I'm from Newfoundland, if you didn't know that about me somehow. And um, I remember hearing Spirit of the West before I heard Great Big Sea, and just thinking like, oh, this is what my music can sound like, and, and what an amazing thing that is. You are such a beloved person here as well. I hope you know that the entire country has been thinking about you both, but like, do, do you feel that? Ah, oh, thanks, Tom, that's very kind of you. Um, yeah, we get a lot of love and support, and it really does help a lot. Um, next time you see him, just give him the biggest squeeze for us and tell him we all love him, okay? Okay, you bet. Jill Dom, thanks for coming in. Thanks, Tom. Ladies and gentlemen, give it please a huge round of applause to the great Jill Dom. Her show, Forget About Tomorrow, is on until Sunday. It's at the BMO Theatre Center. You know, when the Juno Awards come to town, it's a lot more than just the big award show people see on Sunday night. One of the best parts of the Junos every year is the Songwriter Circle. Hosted this year by Raina Doris from CBC Music in the Mornings. It's a chance for musicians to come together, share songs, and talk a little bit about what those songs mean. Right now, you're going to meet the two Canadian music legends who are hosting this year's Songwriter Circle. You may have wept to her songs like Insensitive and Good Mother. You may have worked through your anger issues to albums he's worked on by Metallica, Aerosmith, and Michael Bublé. <laughs> She's an iconic Canadian singer-songwriter. He's one of the greatest record producers of all time. And for their latest record, These Are the Days, they work together. Please welcome to the stage Jan Arden and Bob Rock. This is 
very cool. How you doing? How's it going? It's going good. Yeah, nice to see you. How you doing, Bob? Excellent. Nice to have you here, man. It's nice to meet you. Yeah, it's great to be here. Uh, what's the jam? What, what do you like about working with Bob? He works really quickly. Yeah. And um, he really, Bob, you are one of the, the most musical people I've ever met in my life. He's just got such a beautiful sense of songs. The way he treats other musicians is incredible. It's like all these guys become like puppies out in the studio and they're looking at Bob to see if they've done it right. I'm not gonna lie, I'm feeling that way right now. <laughs> right now. No, I know, but it, just say, you know, you'll do a pass of a song, Bob still puts musicians in a room and has them play tracks, and at the end of it, everyone's looking at him to either, are they gonna come in the room and listen, or are they gonna do it again? And it's, he just, he encourages people. You, you see the magic of words and how far encouragement goes when you tell someone that they're doing well. But he's just inspiring. I, I've enjoyed, we've worked on four records together, and I think this yeah. is our crowning glory. We have 300 years experience between us. <laughs> <laughs> Bob, what about you? What do you like about working with Jim? Uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, working with a lot of artists, sometimes, um, uh, you know, people can get stuck, so to speak. Sometimes they, they think about things, and one of the greatest things is because we've made a lot of records, yeah. uh, we trust each other now. So this last record we did, it was just, it was so easy because we have this thing that we do, yeah. and so... But we've never written together before. Oh, yes. Yeah? So he just said, do you want to try writing a song? And I said, yeah, that would probably be really interesting. Yeah. So I'm, I flew to Maui where he lives, Ooh. and thank God after three days of being there, he, he did show up with a plastic bag full of cords and a computer, <laughs> and like a speaker under one arm, and, and we ended up writing four songs that afternoon. We got together two more times and wrote another nine or ten songs, so four or five in an afternoon, and all those songs pretty much are on These Are The Days. So. We wrote songs in like 45 minutes. It was the craziest fucking... Whoa! Hold on. Hold on. I am so sorry. I forgot we were on the Is radio. everyone all right? Is everyone okay? Is the CBC still a thing? Are we okay? I okay. apologize. We're okay. Hannah Mansing is here. He can take over. I am so sorry. Oh, don't worry I... about it. It's all right. You should see what they cut out of me, it's okay, don't worry But we about didn't it. have time to, to censor ourselves. It just was a really, I'm so sorry. No, don't worry about it, Jen. Stop, stop worrying about it, it's okay. Son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> oh my, Bob. And that's why I like working with him. Yeah, right there. <laughs> Bob, um, I, I have to think, like, I gotta, I've, been, I've, I've been wanting to meet you for a long time, man. Like, I'm a, I'm well, it's a, good to meet you. I'm a big fan of a lot of your records. I've, you got a good story? Like, I want a good story. I was thinking about what you said about trust, when things may have not gone the, wrong, the right way. Do you have any, any good stories about your time in the studio? Um, well, I should tell you about one story that I, with Jan. And this is on the... There we go. Uh, Get the beep going again, please. Thank you, that'd be great. Well, we were finishing up the, the record, and... and uh, we kind of cut, well, we weren't stuck, but there was, um, she said, have you got anything else, any other kind of music? And I said, well, I got this one thing, but um, it's kind of a little heavy, it's, it's kind of rock, it's kind of beefy. And so I played it for her, and she said, just give me the mic. And she wrote down all these words, and I said, well, let's just do it. And she sat on the couch, and she sang it, put the words together in one take, and that's what's on the record. Oh my God. And, how, how, how rare is and, that? And that, it's like, you know, for me, in my career, for, for that kind of thing to happen is why I still love making records. Yeah. Just that moment is to me, and what's great about her is that she felt so comfortable she could do that. Can I say this? Like, it just knowing, knowing your pedigree as I do and knowing the records you made as I do, it's just something, like, I guess when I think about people who have the kind of success that you have, I can see you kind of being cynical about music, and it could be kind of a, you know, it could be, like, it's so, I mean this, it's heartening to see that you still love the spark, the creation of music so much. Well, the, the thing is, is 
right from being a kid, it was always like, how do they do that? And that's why I love making records. That's what I continue to want to be. I want to make better records. I love making records. I still call them records, but <laughs> you know, it's that whole process. It's a magical thing. And so, and this time with Jan, it was just, the whole thing came together so easily. Jane, any good stories from you? Any good stories about working with Bob in the same Oh, time? my gosh. There's so many. I mean, he's very funny to work with. You, you work, like, really hard for 15 minutes. <laughs> and then... Sounds like a CBC to, to me, 15 or 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. And then Bob would come up with the best stories. And we were just all, like, captivated. Like, if you spend two years in a room with Metallica, you've got stories that curl every hair on your body. <laughs> and I just, just the, 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 the things that he comes up with and like the things that I've learned, I sing completely differently in the studio now. What do you mean? I haven't used headphones for the last couple of records and it was very hard to get me off of headphones, you know, doing the mixes in the headphones and singing onto a mic and having effects in your headphones. And Bob said, you know, I want you to just come in the console room. He set up, was it four speakers? Yeah. Like two speakers on the bottom pointing at me, two speakers up here. And he said, just sing in the room. And it was quiet. Mm. And he said, yeah, I learned this from Gene Simmons. <laughs> <laughs> I did, seriously. I'm like, what the hell? <laughs> like Gene Tongue Simmons taught you <laughs> this beautiful technique? And uh, it was. I, I don't know if you put them out of phase, but it's very quiet. The music's coming at you, and you're just singing. And I've never had a problem with my pitch since. Oh, wow. Like, I always was slightly, you know, you tend to be a little sharp or flat, yeah. depending on how loud I was running my headphones. Yeah. So it, it's not the most enjoyable thing, Bob. Like, because <laughs> I, I want to hear myself louder, but it has really changed how I sing. So people are always asking me, you sound so different on this record. And it's because of how he has me approach recording. So I learned things, you know, I've been doing, I've been writing music for 40 years, love songs. And I've learned more from this guy in the last six or seven years than I really have in the span of my career. And yes. it's because he's genuinely eager to share his knowledge. Well, and that's a cool thing with musicians is when they want to share their learned experiences. Yeah. I want to say this then. Um, just looking out, looking out into the audience tonight before we got going, I, I saw a, a lot of musicians came to the show tonight and people who are making it records. It smells like beer in here. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. Yeah. Thanks for saying beer. It's pretty good. Thanks a lot. Yeah, that's great. Um, and I know a lot, of, a lot of musicians listen across the country. Bob, can you... Can you impart some wisdom? Like, what's the most important thing you need to have when it comes to working with an artist? Um, inspiration. I think that's the, that's the basis for making great records. What do you mean? Um, well, putting, I guess, putting people to be, making them comfortable. So, you know, when I first started, uh, it was in the late 70s. And when I first started, I saw that sometimes the musician wasn't comf comfortable, you know, so they can be the best that they are. Mm -hmm. So I've always made it so that studio disappears, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So it's... Uh, it, so, so what Jan said is not a surprise to you. Like, that's, that's, that's learned. That's something you've honed over the years. Oh, what she just described? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. The thing is, is throughout the career, my career, you pick up these little things probably you collect from every album you did. And I've probably done, worked on maybe 150, 200 albums. Yeah. And it's not really what I call smarts, it's maybe just wisdom. It's yeah. thousands and thousands and thousands of hours. I think a lot of times when people are hearing music, and I'm guilty of this as well, it's a very, it's instant gratification and you listen to a track that's four minutes long. Just in my experience watching Bob mix, because he, he does it all. He mixes, he writes, he mm -hmm. produces. Mm -hmm. And that's quite unusual, but it's, it's thousands of hours that are put into the record. And all of those things culminate. He brings all that experience. So every time he works the next artist, I'm a little bit jealous because he's gonna steal shit from me <laughs> and use them with Michael Bublé, I bet, next time. <laughs> and that's exactly. where I'm drawing the line. Yeah. <laughs> 
and I think I just swore again. Ah, don't worry about it. <laughs> We've been off the air for about four hours. You know? <laughs> don't worry about it too much. Guys, uh, congrats on everything, and thanks, thanks for Tom. coming on. Such a pleasure to meet you. Jan Arden and Bob Rocker. Jenner, how incredible, eh? Hey? Are you having a good time, Vancouver? Are you having a good time? They are your hosts for this year's Juno Songwriter Circle taking place this Sunday in Vancouver. You are listening to Q at the Junos in Vancouver. My name is Tom Power. So much more to come. I don't know if you know this, but comedy is making a comeback at the Junos this year. <laughs> So one of the nominees for the awards this year is from Vancouver, British Columbia. His name is Ivan Decker. He just finished up. Come on, let's hear it, let's hear it. His name is Ivan Decker. He just finished up an appearance at the Conan O'Brien show. So get ready for a step up, Ivan. He'll be doing some stand-up for you live at the Vogue Theatre coming up next. Plus, we are going to try and pick the most Vancouver song of all time with our cue this team, Raina Doris and Odario Williams, plus a very special guest from the early edition on CBC Radio 1, Stephen Quinn. By the way, if you're having a good time here, let people know about it. Use the hashtag QJunos. Stick around. Q Live at the Junos in Vancouver is back right after this. I wonder if you guys know this guy here is from, 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 uh, from Vancouver. He's from Vancouver, right? From Vancouver. Mitch Pollock, he's from Vancouver. He's, uh, he's working on the show. Where's Elaine? Elaine, are you there? Elaine, come out. I want to introduce another Q producer from Vancouver, Elaine Chow from Vancouver, British Columbia, everybody. The belt. As you can probably tell, without those people from Vancouver, without people who work on this show and, and make me sound good, I probably wouldn't sound that good at all. So I am incredibly grateful all the time to them. So I know they're listening to this right now. Can you give a round of applause to all the producers who work on Q back in Toronto? That was wild, hey, with Jan and Bob, hey? Wasn't that fun? That was, that was pretty cool. Bob Rock looks exactly like Bob Rock. Do you know what I mean by that? Like, when you meet him, you're like, yeah, of course that's Bob Rock. You know, it's not, that's not a CBC radio host. That's not Rex Murphy. I don't know, I don't know. I don't know. Um, we got a, we got a couple of minutes left. Uh, well, not a couple of minutes left. We're going to do the next block of the show. This is normally the time when the news is on. You know that part of the show? How many of you guys listen, like, on the radio to Q? How many of you listen to the podcast? Oh, you're the future, though, aren't you? You're the future. Um, this is normally the time when the news... Is Ian Hannah Manson here? Ian? Ian, yell out if you're here. Can you do... Like, I wish I had some news to give you right now. This is when the news, do you got any, can, can you make up some news or something or anything or what? He will not. <laughs> Maybe Andrew Chang will. <laughs> uh, I'm, only, I'm only joking, I'm only joking. He's doing a great job of the National. You guys watching the new National? No, come on, I mean, really. Like I think about, I think about the, I think about what, um, <laughs> do you know what to say? I think about what it's like to walk into a show with so much history. I, wasn't, I didn't mean to say that, but I think, but also, you think about what, what it's like to walk into a show with so much history, and it's, um, it's really amazing what you guys have done. So another round of applause for them. Like, it's a beautiful thing. <laughs> it's my favorite chant in the world, is that the entire front row of poor things just shouted, belt, belt, it's the belt. 
I gotta get a new belt, man. All right, so we're about what? Two minutes away? Two, two minutes away? Two or three minutes away? We're about three minutes away. Uh... Oh yeah, any, any, anyone got any questions? We're gonna do a Q&A afterwards, but anyone got any questions or anything? Do I have my banjo? Oh, yeah, I, don't, I travel with it wherever I go. It's, it follows me around. It's a weird thing to play the banjo. I'm not going to lie to you. Like, it's, a, it's a weird thing because I, I, I played it when it was uncool, like PM, pre-Mumford. <laughs> you know, like when I started playing the banjo, everyone was like, well, I'm apparently going through puberty. When I started playing the banjo, I, st I, I was going through puberty, and it wasn't, they were like, oh, yeah, you're, you're playing the banjo, you and your... You and your cocktails and your espresso shots and your gas town, I don't know, right? And I was like, no, but it wasn't the case at all. Like, I was just this nerdy guy playing the banjo in, in St. John's and just looking up to Alan Doyle, <laughs> who might be the greatest human in the world, and, uh, and, and you know, meeting girls <laughs> through the banjo. Did not, uh, did, not, did not happen that often. But, um, but it's been one of the coolest things uh, to be able to do on the show has been able to do, uh, like me play banjo with people. Like I play with, with Passenger and I play with Bela Fleck and I am not that good, but these people make me sound better and for that I'm eternally grateful. So we're about one minute left. I'm just gonna check in with the staff to make sure that everything's going okay. Um, are you guys having a good time? All right, all right. It's not worth it, it's not worth it. I'm gonna regret that when I'm standing up later. It is not worth it. One minute away? All right, cool. Frank, how are you doing, man? Frank, you got a spirit belt? <laughs> no, that's all right, buddy. That's okay. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's okay. I don't need that. Mom, can you say hi to my mom? Yeah, sure. What's your mom's name? Deborah. Her name is Deborah, and she loves me? Oh, that's so nice. I have no idea where you are. I'm staring at a gentleman who is not talking to me, going, Oh, really? Your mom? That's so nice. Um, okay, I can do that. I'll say, so let me do it first. Hi, Deborah. I love you too. And can we, at the count of three, say hi, Deborah. I love you too. Ready? One, two, three. Hi, Deborah. I love you too. Amazing. Just absolutely beautiful. Let's do the show. Ready? for the Juno Awards. By the way, you can catch the Juno Awards this Sunday. There's just one place you need to go, cbcmusic.ca slash Junos. This weekend is historic for a reason you might not even know about. The Junos are bringing back the award for Comedy Album of the Year. It'll be the first time in over three decades that someone wins that award. It's pretty wild when you think about how big the comedy scene is in this country particularly in Vancouver, where you can see great comedians every night of the week. And we have one of those great ones here tonight. He's nominated for the Juno for Comedy Album of the Year for his album, I Wanted to Be a Dinosaur. Ladies and gentlemen, from Vancouver, British Columbia, please welcome Ivan Decker. <laughs> Vancouver, thank you so much for coming out, everybody. This is great. Historic, historic even. First time stand-up's been on the queue, you told me, also. Yeah, so, I mean, that's also pretty neat. Pretty good, I enjoy new things, usually. I will take recommendations from people for new experiences. Restaurants, but it can be a gamble, right? I went out recently to a restaurant with a theme where the theme was that you eat everything in the dark. <laughs> People told us to go, that you should go, because the darkness 
enhances your ability to taste the flavors. <laughs> and we went, and it does not. <laughs> what the darkness does enhance is your inability to know whether or not there's anything on your fork until it is in your mouth, empty. <laughs> yeah, close your lips around cold, bare steel 25 times in a row in an abyss of darkness <laughs> and see if you feel like you made the right choice for anything. I just can't imagine that anybody is going there more than once. It purely must be based on curiosity. You're like, what's it like? What's it like to eat in a dark restaurant? I know that's how I felt. And if you're thinking like that, it's very easy to find out what it's like. All you have to do is go to any restaurant and close your eyes. That is it. Just shut your eyes and then after 10 minutes when you start to feel like this is stupid, why did I agree to this? I should open them. Keep them shut because that's part of it. It's mostly just being frustrated in a room full of people. You don't know how many people are in there, because there are others, but you don't know where they are. You don't know where the exits are. You have to try to gather information like a bat. Just listen. But if you listen to that restaurant, you are not gonna get any information because all you hear from every direction is just people going like this. Whoops, careful. <laughs> Oops, excuse me. Clank, did that spill? I don't know. Was it full? It sounded full. How do we check? Touch it, see if it's wet. It's wet. It spilled for sure. What was it? I don't know, but it's on my pants, so we'll find out. It's just such a ridiculous experience. And yes, even though it is very frustrating to eat in the dark, I was... I enjoyed one part of it, and that is because even though you can't see anything, which is annoying, you realize part of the meal that nobody can see you, and that's awesome, because that means no table manners. Like, that should be 100% of their advertising. Hey, does your spouse eat like a weird horse? Come to the dark. <laughs> Do whatever you want. Because I was eating with my girlfriend. She was like, I'm having trouble keeping the salad on my fork. Is that happening to you? I was like, you're still using your fork? <laughs> Why? What, is the queen in here wearing night vision goggles? I ate my salad in one handful, like popcorn. The bowl that it came in is on my head as a hat right now. It is dark, live your life. So strange, right? They would overcomplicate the restaurant experience. Like there are people going to a restaurant eating food they can see and then going, ugh, too easy. <laughs> Boring, challenge me, restaurant. Take away a sense. Which is why I wanna get in the game. I'm gonna open a restaurant we take away a sense. Mine's not gonna be vision though. Mine is gonna be no touching. Come in, open your mouth, we're gonna throw food at your face. It's hard enough, right? I don't know. Things at a restaurant never really go smoothly. The bill payment, I'm glad they have improved that portion, right? Because they now have portable debit terminals they can bring to the table. Because before those, if you want to pay with debit, you had to follow them on like a weird debit quest. <laughs> How'd you like to pay? Debit? Ugh, come with me. Where are we going? No talking on the journey. <laughs> But now it's great, because they bring the machine, right? And I love the machine. What I love most about it is the name, The Machine. So we call it. We don't say what it is or what it does. I like to pay my bill. Do you need the machine? Yes! Bring me the machine! Oh, it is so fun to be here. Thank you guys so much for listening to me. So great, such an honor. Thank you so much.
Oh, man. Yeah, that's, that's fine. That's behind. It's, it's beautiful. That's very funny. Perfect. That's great. Thank you, man. Congra Thank you. Congratulations. Oh, thanks. So, like, this is, this is, oh, it's been over 30 years since there was a comedy album of the year Juno given out. Like, just, what does it mean to be nominated in this category? It's insane. It's insane to be a part of such a prestigious event and of work. Because, I mean, you know, musicians, they're all just so talented. They have so many things to worry. I mean, we heard about studios and levels, and I just go to a restaurant and not like it. <laughs> <laughs> and then I yell about it. <laughs> and people are like, same award. <laughs> same one for that. What is it? Um, what is it about Vancouver? Like every like, there's you, there's, there's Kevin Banner. There's amazing comedy coming out of Vancouver right now. What's what's going on? Yeah, it's such a great. Is city it a good-looking mayor? Is that what it is? <laughs> oh, I don't know. Some people in here don't like him. Oh, I didn't know that. Is that a thing? Oh no. Too many know. bike lanes. Ah, we're all mad. <laughs> yeah, the too many bike lane people are definitely the CBC people for yeah, sure. It's... Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It is a great city for comedy, in spite of the fact that there is nowhere to park. So I don't know how people are getting to shows, but good for you. It's very similar to other cities, except when you come to a show in Vancouver, it is a lot easier to get kombucha. Like the, the fermented... Yeah, there's some, it's like at the show. I have no idea what that is, by the way. I've been, people have been saying, like, do you like kombucha? And I'm like, oh yeah, I love kombucha. Oh yeah. I have no idea what it is. Like, I think it's just tea that was left in the fridge too long. I don't know what it is. You know what? I don't think anybody knows what it is. <laughs> we just like saying kombucha. Yeah, kombucha. Yeah, sweet booch, bro. You booching tonight? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, my tum tum hurts. Hit it with some booch. <laughs> booch, then beach. That's the Vancouver way. <laughs> Ivan Decker, everybody. What a pleasure, man. Congratulations. Hi, this is Michael Bublé, and you're listening to Q with incomparable Tom Powell. Because we're here in Vancouver, one of the greatest music cities in Canada, and in this beautiful music venue, The Vogue, we thought we'd ask, what is the most Vancouver song? A special edition of our Q This Team is here to try and answer that question. Please welcome from CBC Music's Mornings, Raina Doris, from CBC Music After Dark, Odaria Williams, and the host of the early edition on Radio One in Vancouver, please welcome Stephen Quinn. Steven? Tom? Something going on, man, because, because I'm from... Oh, Dario, we're here in real life, man. <laughs> are, are you videotaping this? I am the behind-the-scenes guy, so I'm being behind the scenes. But these are the scenes. You're on the scene. This is the scenes. <laughs> Adam. Oh yeah, right. <laughs> All right. Uh, nice to have you here, Stephen. So I'm from, I'm from Newfoundland, if you haven't noticed that before. Because <laughs> oh. I'm so charming. Um, uh, over here uh, is Raina Doris, who's from Toronto. And Odaria Williams from Winnipeg, Manitoba. Peg City. Peg City. You are the sole Vancouver representative on the panel. I am, therefore I win. <laughs> is there such a thing as a Vancouver sound? Um, I'm going to say no. Um, not in a way that we think of there being a Seattle sound or, you know, Pearl Jam or Nirvana and Soundgarden and grunge. And we, got, we have a, uh, an incredible diversity of music here. Right. Um, and, and more than that, I mean, you can, if, you, if you try to qualify or classify music here, I find myself, instead of talking about genre, uh, kind of talking about uh, era. And to me, there's the kind of pre-expo sound and the post-expo sound. Right. And all of the music that was inspired by Expo, right. which is not necessarily complimentary of, yeah. <laughs> of Expo. 
Uh, but no, I mean, when you look at some of the Vancouver bands, what we just heard, I mean, um, you know, you hear Said the Whale, you hear, uh, I, uh, I mean, Ancients, Three Inches of Blood, these are all Vancouver bands. I, I told Lisa Christensen I would say that <laughs> for her. Um, but uh, Dan Mangan is out there in the audience as well. Is there, is, is there anything more Vancouver than Dan Mangan and Veda Hilly singing at the same time? No, right, right. I don't know. So what we did was we asked each of you to bring a song that could be a candidate for most Vancouver song of all time. Raina, you're up first. Let's have a listen. I'm up first. Yeah. Gosh. Sorry, buddy. As the, thanks for being the one Torontonian born and raised up first on the Vancouver sound question. So <laughs> what, what is it? All right. Well, I think I actually have a pretty unassailable argument. Hardcore punk. Yeah. Yeah. Now, if you're not sure, I know there are a lot of hardcore punk fans in the audience. I heard you singing along to Michael Bublé earlier. <laughs> uh, the hardcore punk is faster, louder, and more intense than regular punk rock. So what song? What song did you pick? Oh, th what song did I pick? Yeah, yeah. I'll we'll just get right to it. DOA and Jello Biafra, that's progress. All right, so that's DOA, Jello Biafra. Um, let's go around. Stephen, what do you think? What do you think of that choice? Um, I think that's the most dead Kennedy sounding DOA I've ever heard, but. Uh, Jello Biafra. I know. Oh my God. Um, it's, uh, that's pre expo, right? I believe so, yes. Yeah, that would absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, yeah. and that, I mean, pre had a great anyway, punk scene yeah. in those days, and it was, you know, it went all the way up and down the West Coast uh, to LA and back. And, uh, you know, Bob Mould talks about Vancouver and, and what a great punk rock town it was and how there was this terrific community back then. Oh, uh, Daria, what, what do you think? Sorry, you know, I have uh, a confession to make. I did not know that DOA was from Vancouver. Oh, my Lord. Yeah. There you have it. Wow. Well, the yeah. term hardcore punk started here. That's all right, all right. So, Hardcore 81, DOA album, first time anyone used the term hardcore punk. You started the genre, it has to be your song. All right, all right. Now we're going to go to Odario, <laughs> your choice. Let's take a listen. It's just the sole obligation to clench your mic and lecture, and for which free is my occupation. I'm always eager, getting through like a cleaver with foresight to bring back mine. I went to spray, grappled and tackled lyrical linebacker, made the play. So now the crowd. All right, Odaria, what did we just hear? Yes, released in 1997, one of my favorite Canadian hip hop albums of all time, Rascals with Cash Crop. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's, yeah. A good one. that's a good one. I get it. Why did you choose that one? Well, so if you were growing up in the 90s and you're into hip hop, you were pretty much inspired by East Coast rap, right. which was anything that came out of New York City or along that coast. But what I liked about Vancouver hip hop is that they were influenced by the West Coast. Right. They were very chill. So they had their own vibe going on. They were actually influenced by anything from uh, Seattle right down to Los Angeles. And anyone that was not from Vancouver just didn't get it. And that's the best point. Uh, just to be able to not understand what was going on over there in Vancouver uh, just was intriguing and, yeah. and mysterious. And, and the rascals just implemented all that. I think we can all agree, strong candidate. Strong candidate, right? Yeah. Raina, strong candidate? I'd say so. Pretty good chance. All right, so Stephen, again, as the one local on the stage, lots mm -hmm. of pressure here on you. And I understand, did you crowdsource your pick here? Is that what you did? We tried. Right. We got a lot of trooper requests, though. <laughs> <laughs> you know what they say, we're here for a long time. Yeah, not a good time. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad we teamed up on that. It's pretty know. good. It's good. Enjoy it works. Yeah. Uh, my pick, and uh, I'm sucking up to the hometown crowd, but I really do feel strongly about it, is uh, Profiteers by Spirit of the West from their unbelievably great 1988 album. Labor Day. Let's take a listen. I'm all right, Jack, and how about you? Gonna catch me a wave that's rolling through and turn a trick or two. I'm all right, Jack, no flies 
That is Spirit of the West and Profiteers. Raina, what do you think? I think it's a strong choice, right? It's a strong choice. I mean, you, ha you got everybody clapping along instantly. So that... <laughs> I mean, they were clapping along to DOA, too, pretty good. You couldn't hear the clapping as well, I guess. No, there was more singing. <laughs> there was more chanting. Oh, yeah, 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 I'd say, I mean, it's a, it's a very strong choice. Oh, Daria, what do you think? Whenever Spirit of the West is playing, my feet start doing this. and start stomping. I don't know what it is. And that's since I was a little kid. Spirit of the West really does it. It's, really a, it's, it's an especially meaningful, I mean, it's, it's, it's an especially meaningful year for Spirit of the West this year. We've been thinking a lot about them, right? Uh, it, it is, and, and this song uh, from 1988 is, it's a post-expo song. Um, it, it doesn't have the word uh, reneviction in it, but it's exactly what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. And you can hear this song 30 years later, this is the anniversary of the album. 30 years later, you can hear what, he's, what John Mann is singing about there, and it's truer today than it ever was. And, uh, you know, John's a, a voice we need now. All right, so it's time for our audience to vote on who won. The laughter is not a good sign. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, I'm not feeling great no, about like, this. Like, like <laughs> the premise of a vote is laughable. Not a good, not a good sign. But let's uh, let's try it. I, I vote we waive the vote. <laughs> Who votes for that progress by DOA and Jello Biafra? Yeah. <laughs> Been a weird year. It's also about not being able to afford a house here, just saying. There you go. <laughs> Is it Soul Obligation by the Rascals? <laughs> the robot, radio listeners. He's doing the robot. Or is the Spirit of the West and Profiteers? I think we know who the winner is. Spirit of the West and Profiteers. Odaria Williams is the host of After Dark. Thanks. Uh, Raina Doris is the host of Mornings on CBC Music, doing an incredible job. And Stephen Quinn is the host of Early Edition on CBC Radio 1. Thanks a lot for coming in. We are almost done here at the Vogue Theater in Vancouver. Before we go, though, let's welcome her back to the stage one more time. She is nominated for two Juno Awards, including Artist of the Year. And when she's not fending off bear attacks, she's writing jams. Please welcome, performing New Fears, This is Lights.
One more time, let's hear it for lights, everybody. Give a round of applause. And that, my friends, is all the time we have. Thank you for everything, Vancouver. Thank you to Jen Arden, Bob Rock, Ruth B, Jill Dom, Chaos, Ivan Decker, Raina Doris, Adari Williams, Stephen Quinn, and Lights. You've been an amazing crowd. Thank you to the Vogue Theater for having us. Thanks to the Q staff back in Toronto, the CBC staff here in Vancouver. Remember to tune in to the Juno Awards this Sunday on CBC Television. You can stream it online too at cbcmusic.ca slash junos. My name is Tom Power. Thanks a lot, guys. Take care.